Um, so you and Edwards are both post-millennials. Yes. Um, and so uh, you believe that uh, things are getting better and better and better. Medications are working. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, so the obvious the obvious question is going to be: Isn't that a little kind of Pollyannish? It, it doesn't seem like things are getting better and better and better. And so, um, what's up with that? How do you how do you deal with that? Well, let me illustrate it this way: um, the, In the Korean War, there was a there was a Marine general when the Chinese came into the war. They flooded in. They surrounded this Marine general's unit. And they were completely surrounded. The general looked around at all of them and he said, "Well, they can't get away now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So here, here's the here's a weird dichotomy. Uh, Latimer and Ridley tied to stakes. You know, yeah. they're about to be burned to death yep. um, in England. Play the man, Master Ridley. I trust we shall light today such a candle as, by God's grace, shall never be never be put out. Right. All right. And what he's doing, he's tied to a stake, and he's saying. We've got them on the run. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got them on the run, Ridley. Yeah, right. You know, play the man. We've we've got them. Uh, God God's gonna uh, pursue this. Th and then a modern Christian, modern evangelical Christian, right. watches the evening news on his plasma flat screen mm -hmm. in his lazy boy, and looks at another depressing news story. And he gets up from his lazy boy to walk into the kitchen, um, climate controlled kitchen, to yeah. open the fridge and get a drink and say, yeah. "Honey, it's the last days of." Yeah, um, they're coming for us next. Uh -huh. And I said, what's, what's different uh -huh. here? These guys were beleaguered, surrounded, overwhelmed. They had troubles, as Edwards had troubles. I mean, where, right. where was he? You know, yeah. He's on the edge of this continent with yep. a continent full of trees. And, yep. um, and he has this robust faith in uh, a glorious future for the world. And we, modern contemporary evangelicals, who have never had it so good, Mm -hmm. If if a psychological explanation for these things were mm -hmm. to be applied, you would think it would be the other way around. Mm. You would think that the martyrs were the ones saying everything's going to hell in a handbasket, and you would think that we would be the Pollyanna ones, right? Right, but we're but we're, but not. we're not we're generally. Not. So I I believe that uh, the the future of the planet should be dictated to us by what the Bible reveals, not by my own personal circumstances. Okay. I could have a great, if I'm in, a, in an army at war, I could lose my life in an, an encounter where our army won a great victory, a great battle, and a great war. Uh -huh. But I might lose my life. Right. Um, or I might have a pretty uh, posh assignment yeah. in a losing war. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I can't, I can't evaluate how things are going by how things are going for me. Yeah. I have to evaluate it based on what God reveals in Scripture. Uh -huh. And I think Edward saw, as, as I've come to see, that the Bible promises that the earth is going to be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. And I might see that in, in a country with a high standard of living and relative peace, uh -huh. or I might see it in a time of conflict and war. Uh -huh. and it's, it's faith that sees that. So, so with that, though, um, the, the sort of the philosophy of history that comes out of that, um, there's an Edwards scholar who, who argues that Edwards has these, he's these what he calls, I think, competing motifs, one of which is sort of this uh, cyclical motif, which is that, you know, everything goes up and then everything comes down and everything goes up and everything comes down and everything goes up. So there's a cycle of, you know, uh, sort of rise and, and fall. Mm -hmm. And then he also has this um, more progressive, you know, what you just described, sort of uh, the um, earth's going to be filled and it's, it's filling mm -hmm. up. Here we go. Yeah. Um, and so th those feel like they're competing. Either it's this sort of cycle, this uh, back and forth between God and the devil, between the powers of light, the powers of darkness, till the end, or right. we're, we're further up and further in, we're going up. So okay. how, how do you... The way I reconcile together? those is say that eschatology, uh, post-millennial eschatology, I think rightly understood, is mountain biking up a mountain where there's a good many downs and okay. valleys. And, okay. you know, so it's... It, um, Postmillennialism does not require you to say, and the kingdom of God takes off like the space shuttle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And boom, and, and every day and every way, everything's getting better and better. Okay. It's not like that. The images that Jesus uses, the mustard seed becoming a great plant or the yeast put in the loaf, um, the kingdom of God does not ri arrive like the 82nd Airborne. Right. The kingdom of God arrives slowly, quietly. Who figured that out? Who saw that coming? And so my view of eschatology is three steps forward, two steps back, five steps forward, three steps back, okay. you know, or the mountain back going up the uh, the craggy mountainside. 
And that means that if you look at church history in 25-year chunks, uh -huh. you might be grotesquely, grotesquely misled about how this is. Right. You know, you might look at a 25-year chunk where everything's falling apart, uh -huh. or 50-year chunks, everything's falling apart. But I would submit that if you look at church history in 500-year chunks, uh -huh. that's you divide it up into four pieces. Right. Would I rather be? Is the kingdom of God more poised for advance now? Or in 1500? Hmm. Now. How about 1500 and 1000? Well, 1500. Mm -hmm. How about 1000 or 500? Hmm. Well, 1000. Right. Right. So if I, if I take the chunks, if I look at the bicyclist going up the mountain and I get a wide angle lens on it, right. I can tell he's going up. Uh -huh. Right. But if I, if I just focus in on the, on, on yeah. the last five minutes, it might, it might be all. Downhill. Down, it might all be all downhill. And that's how I think you can harmonize those two elements in Edwards. The cyclic thing. It's not a cycle on a flat road. Right. It's cyclic uh, up. Okay. And, um, and at the same, the other ten is, is there's this confidence that it's overall going to be up. Overall up. So that, that raises um, maybe two, two other issues about the, maybe objections or, or criticisms. The first would have to do with um, this idea of sort of slow mustard seed growth. Um, you know, post millennials, as far as at least as far as I can tell, aren't known for sort of missionary endeavors. Right. They're not. You know, it's the it's the premillennial dispensational guys who are out. Right. You know, in in Africa and South America, just lighting it up. Um, and so, you know, how how does that, how does that fit? Is it does does the sort of slow growth mean that there's not the same push? There's not yeah. the same push for the, the the frontier missionary unreached peoples of the world who have no yeah. witness within them. Um, Yes, you, you don't want the slow growth mustard seed thing to, say, translate into a slow coach approach to missions. Okay. Right. You don't want that. But I would say in our defense, on the reason there, the reason there isn't a big post-millennial explosion of missions is that there are hardly any of us. <laughs> <laughs> Three of you in Idaho. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. as recently as, you know, back when Lorraine Bettner was publishing his yep. Post-millennial stuff. People were saying he's the he was the last living specimen. I mean, yeah. You know, he goes and that's it, uh -huh. right? Um, so th there, the last twenty years, twenty to thirty years, has seen a resurgence of post-mill okay. thinking, and we're just getting it sorted out. We're just we're still getting organized, and uh -huh. you know, um, so that's the first thing. Then the second thing is, well, historically, has there ever been? Uh, you know, post millennials are not known for their um, sense of mission, and, I, and immediately I thought David Livingston. Right. right. All right. What about? Let, let's go back to when post millennial believers were plentiful, uh -huh. when there were a lot of them. Well, they invented right modern. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, Edwards would be a, Ed, right. Edwards would be an example. example of it. So some of the great missions thinkers and um, and laborers in the harvest were post millennial, and when post millennialism D uh, died is too strong, but when it Declined, waned, yeah. when it would, yeah. when it waned, a lot of the cultural impetus for ongoing missions was picked up by the premillennial dispensational uh, mm -hmm. folks. Uh, and and hats off to them, and thank the Lord for them, and everything they're they're doing this. But I think it's, uh, um, I'm not quite sure that they could have given their theology. Gotten it established. I see the, uh, the same way the post millennials, uh, post millennial uh, believers did, and once, if, as I believe God gives us uh, a resurgence of post millennial optimism, I have every expectation that there will be a, a magnificent surge in missions because of it. Well, I mean, how could there not be? Uh -huh. If you believe that that the world will be, all the nations will be converted, and everybody will come to Christ, and yeah. you know. How is that? How yeah. is that inconsistent with a view of missions? Right. So, and maybe that, maybe that's a question there. Um, you know, you said postmillennial optimism. Is the is the opt is the optimism really the thing? Is that really the sort of thing in terms of what you're after, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to sort of a uh, um, you know schematic diagrams of uh, uh, postmillennial thought or something like that? I mean, like. Um, in other words, can you have optimistic premillennials, optimistic amillennials, yeah. and and what you're advocating for is the optimism? Correct. More than the other. Uh, if um, uh, I heard Gary North or read Gary North one time said, "There's only two eschatologies." Uh -huh. He's, he called them optimillennialism and pessimillennialism. Okay. And I'm not interested in what I call the train schedules approach to eschatology. Um, 
I don't think we ought to have detailed schematic diagrams and then revelation breaks out. And, uh -huh. You know, I don't think we know enough yet to to be dogmatic okay. there. Um, but I think we can get the gist and get the general flow. Right. And so an optimistic premillennialist would be someone like Charles Spurgeon. Right. He was optimistic premill. There are a number of amillennial uh, folks that yep. are optimistic. Yep. Uh, and for me, a good book, um, Roderick Campbell's um, Israel and the New Covenant. Okay. Uh, it's so yeah. God, you go, go. Yeah. Okay. Um, post millennials, post millennialists have to be optimistic by definition. Amillennialists might or might not be. Right. Uh, and premillennials might or might not be. Right. But there's nothing inherently gotcha. inconsistent. Okay. Uh, in the different eschatological positions that prevents optimism from be taking root in all three. Okay. So then maybe one last criticism, um, and this this seems to be, um, I think, a fairly serious one, in that if you think that things are going to get better and better and better, even if we're defining that sort of long view, um, what does that do to a theology of suffering, which seems in the New Testament to sort of be just core? Paul thinks that, that, that Paul believes that the gospel advances through apostolic suffering. And if you think that the suffering is going to be diminishing as we right. get closer and closer to Christ's return, doesn't that sort of undermine this, this core thing that the, the, the way that God is going to move in the world is through a suffering church? Well, if it undermines it, it only undermines it in the same way that going to heaven does. Right? Okay. Right. If, uh, if we, so we go to heaven. Uh, can we grow in our love for Christ there? Okay, I see. Can, yep. can we praise Him more and more there? Can we mature and, and be strengthened there? Well, golly, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope that we're not standing around forever and ever. Yeah, stuck. Well, this, this, or sort of stuck. So if, if sanctification and growth and uh, approaching God is something that can be done in the resurrection without any tears at all, uh-huh. Right, then certainly God could figure out a way to have it happen for us in a world where uh, tears are fewer, enemies yep. more and more enemies are defeated, and and so oh, forth. Okay. So in Isaiah, where it says the man who dies when he's a hundred is considered accursed, uh -huh. what that tells you is uh, one people in that setting still die. Right, uh -huh. everybody dies in uh -huh. that setting. Uh, but a hundred years old seems like the man yeah. who was cut off in his prime. Yeah. And and that also relativizes the affliction. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Get, you know. So um, everybody has to. Everybody wherever they live has to deal with things. Uh -huh. And so when I, as a pastor in the 20th century, when I, uh, P. J. O'Rourke said he could refute those who say there is no progress with one word. And he said that word is dentistry. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> right. So um, I I can go to a dentist regularly and f experience no pain at all. Uh -huh. Right. Right. Um, and 500 years ago, that was not the case. Possible. Yeah. Now, does that mean that I've got no worries, or that I've got nothing to trust God for, or that, yeah. that or that fam family members can't die, or that I can't love people who go to be with the Lord, or that I have to work through? Well, no, I have to work through all of those things and I have to do it the way the apostles modeled for us mm -hmm. you know so fi 50 years before the end when when things are glorious uh, c where someone from 50 AD looking at that would be flum flummoxed yeah. nevertheless for the person living in that era he must take up his cross daily and still follow and still follow Christ okay. and that will be a meaningful Thing to have to for him to have to do, okay. and he will be doing it in a way that is building on the maturity of the church beforehand, and and so f I th I, so I believe there's going to be a way to further up and further in it, even then, even then. So so that we're not talking about sort of a premature health, wealth, prosperity type, right? There will always be temptations in this fallen world to put yourself first as opposed to the other. There will yeah. always be opportunities for me to die, uh -huh. for me to Give it Light up for me to for me to uh, for a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church. That will always that's never going out of. So it's not like we're going to crest the the lip of the golden age and then uh -huh. say <laughs> I'm glad coast, I'm glad all that that self denial stuff is over. Uh -huh. you know, now downhill downhill into heaven. Okay. No.